parliamentary colleagues, health officials, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I want to provide the country and the media with an update on our continuing efforts to respond to the health and economic challenges posed by the COVID-19 virus. Health officials have confirmed three more cases on the island of New Providence. There is a total of 14 confirmed cases of COVID-19 to date. Two in Grand Bahama and the remaining on New Providence. Two of the COVID positive individuals have been admitted to doctor's hospital on Blake Road. All other cases are doing extremely well. We have seen a doubling of confirmed cases over the last four days. We anticipate more cases in a short period of time over the coming 20 days. And this suggests that we are at the beginning of an expected surge. This means we must increase our efforts to restrict the spread of this virus and to save lives. The Ministry of Health Surveillance Unit has started the process of mapping COVID-19 cases to help identify potential clusters of cases and to assist the ministry's strategy to mitigate the spread of the virus in communities. This will help to identify cases early and decrease the need for hospital-based services. It is critical that each and every one of us take personal responsibility and do everything in our power to reduce the spread of this virus. The government will continue to closely monitor the increases in cases on a daily basis and respond accordingly. Our response to COVID-19 is guided by the analysis and advice provided by the health professionals coordinating the response to this coronavirus. After my remarks, I will ask health officials to answer your questions. I wish to announce that tomorrow, the House of Assembly will meet to debate a resolution to approve the continuance of the emergency powers COVID-19 regulations made on the 17th of March and the emergency powers COVID-19 orders made on the 23rd of March until the 8th of April, 2020. The resolution will ask for approval for the continuance of a state of emergency until the 8th of April, 2020, inclusive of the emergency powers and authority in the two orders. The resolution extends the emergency proclamation for an additional eight days. We must avoid speculation and rely on health officials to continue to advise where the country is in the fight against COVID-19. As Prime Minister and as a medical doctor, I will act based on facts and the best medical and scientific information possible. I once again ask you to be guided by health officials and reliable information from credible sources. Tragically, in Iran, approximately 300 people have died from drinking methanol, which is a toxic industrial alcohol not intended for drinking purposes. A false and fake report circulated in the country which claimed that methanol could prevent COVID-19. A media report described a five-year-old boy 
who is now blind. Because his parents gave him methanol to drink, because they believed the fake news about it is a way to, vi to prevent the virus viral illness. Falls and fake information can lead to death and to harm. Please, I beg again, please, do not pass on information that does not come from credible sources. We do not want any of our bohemian citizens or guests to die in a similar manner as a result of taking medication, false medication as a result of fake news and irrelevant information. Yesterday, my office became aware of a voice note circulating on social media that contained false claims that I would announce a countrywide 30-day shutdown on Monday. That claim was fake and false. Such information could have led to panic and a run on grocery stores and other establishments that could harm our efforts to contain the COVID-19 virus. This matter has been turned over to the Commissioner of Police for further investigation. I wish to once again plead with individuals to refrain from putting out and spreading such false and potentially harmful information. Let me be very and extremely blunt. Some people have very hard heads. Well, the virus is harder and badder than the hardest of heads in this country. And as the old people would say, hard heads don't make good soup. But together, the Bahamian people are stronger and more resilient than this virus, but only if we work together. My number one priority, each of our priorities must be to save lives and to protect our health and the health of our loved ones, neighbors, and fellow Bahamians and residents. I want this curfew to end as soon as possible. I want these restrictions over as soon as possible. But for now, we have to stop the spread of this virus. And to help to stop the spread of COVID-19, the Royal Bahamas Police Force will increase efforts to enforce the curfew regulations. There are still too many vehicles on our roads. Individuals aged 75 and older are asked not to leave their homes. Those between the ages of 65 and 74 should work from within their homes. And the purpose is not to isolate our senior citizens by asking them to stay at home, the purpose is to save lives. Our elderly represent wisdom. We must save and protect the wise in our society. Family members should stay in regular contact with older relatives. And please make sure they have their regular medications, groceries, and supplies so they don't have to leave their respective homes. Each household should have one designated shopper. Grocery stores with the capability will be encouraged to activate online shopping platforms to reduce the number of people having to come into their stores for food and supplies and the length of time customers have to spend in their respective stores. The government 
will introduce a food shopping schedule. Shopping days and times will be designated based on the first letter of a person's last name. More details will be released further this week. This measure is intended to reduce the number of people on the road and to reduce the number of people at grocery stores at any one time. This is to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Again, let me stress, our food stocks are healthy. There are no shortage of food supply. There is no need for panic buying. We are still receiving international cargo and there is no shortage of food or fuel. There is enough supply for everyone. We also have adequate supplies of fuel and propane. We are seeing more litter on our streets, which could pose other health challenges like rodent infestations and leptospirosis. We do not want to move from one disease entity, one killer, to another. So kindly resist and cease from littering our streets and our environment. Please dispose of garbage properly and in a sanitary manner. Let us use this time as an opportunity to practice best, better environmental practices. And I wish to remind you of a number of current and additional measures. Pharmacies will be allowed to operate from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Banks will be allowed to operate from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Landscaping and property maintenance businesses and janitorial services businesses will be allowed to operate on Saturday and Sunday only. Pay pool maintenance businesses will be allowed to operate on Friday and Saturday only. All street or roadside vendors will be prohibited from opening. I repeat, all street and roadside vendors must and will be removed by the police. Our streets will be cleared. This does not include newspaper vendors who should remain at one location. To ensure that the reconstruction efforts of Grand Bahama, Abaco, and the Ragged Island do not come to a halt, construction companies working on rebuilding projects on these islands have been exempted from the, exigence, from the emergency orders. Hardware stores to service those construction companies have also been exempted. I wish to advise that all public parks will be closed beginning at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, the 31st of March. As previously announced, exercise will only be permitted within the confines of your property or your immediate neighborhood. Driving to any exercise site or facility is prohibited. Fellow Bahamians, the number of infections continues to rise, though we still do not fully know the rate of infection which we continue to analyze and to assess. What we do know is that a rise in infections means there is community spread. And community spread is a medical term not understood by many. And to put it in everyday language, this means that the virus is going around. So I ask and urge you, please stay indoor and stay off the road. Community spread means that the virus is here and going around. If you do not listen to the public health advice, you could catch the virus, it could make you sick, and you can die. You could spread it to your friends and family, neighbors and others. It could make them sick and then they can die. 
More than 30,000 people have died worldwide from this virus. And let me tell you what happened to many of the dead in some countries. They have been taken into hospital isolation wards for treatment. This means isolation. No friends or family members were able to see them because of how contagious COVID-19 is. They endured treatment alone. They got sicker alone. Many died alone with no friends or relatives at their sides. You do not want this to be your fate or the fate of anyone you know or any Bahamian or resident. To avoid this from happening, I again plead with you to follow public health advice and the regulations in the emergency orders. It is in as much as possible, stay at home. And I repeat again, stay at home. Stay off our streets. When you stay at home, you limit your exposure to people who have this virus in the Bahamas. We do not want a surge of sick people at our hospitals. What we have seen from, uh, from other countries after country is that when this happens, hospital systems are quickly overwhelmed. Hospitals are not able to treat those who need help. Many people die as a result. I told you last week about a country in Europe where there was approximately 800 deaths in one day. That same country has now seen approximately 900 deaths in a single day. Many rich and powerful countries cannot handle the large number of critically ill patients. It is important you hear and heed the message of health officials who are trying to save your life and protect your health. Do not be a foolish person who is up and down around town, who only realizes this is a crisis when you are waiting on medical help and you cannot breathe. Listen to the advice our public health officers have given from the beginning of this crisis. Encourage your friends and your family to stay at home as well. As a medical doctor, I can tell you that patients who listen do better. Those who do not have worse outcomes and put their lives at risk. For us to overcome as a country, we must work as one united citizen army in this fight. We must remain as one united citizen army and we will overcome. We are now a citizen army fighting this together. Many on the front lines in our citizen army are, are dedicated medical professionals who are putting themselves at risk on our behalf. As a sign of gratitude, I ask you to be a part of this citizen's army by doing all you can to limit the spread of this infection. You can play your important part by firstly following advice and the temporary emergency regulations. I then need you to ensure your family does the same. By extension, I need you to urge your friends and neighbors to do the same. Your mental health is also important. I know the emergency measures are difficult, and I hear the complaints every day. They are put in place to save lives. They will only last 
as long as is necessary. And someone sent me these words of encouragement that I want to pass on to you. Fear is a disease. Hope is its only cure. So in these difficult days, which will last for some time, do not be overcome by fear. Many are understandably worried and anxious, but try to turn those emotions into something positive. It is important to watch and to read reliable and credible news. It is important to watch the briefings we give. But do not spend your days bogged down consuming news that will make you depressed and make you frightened and scared. It is important to exercise following the regulations on where you can go. It is important to go outside to catch some sun. It is also important to do some activities inside and outside with your family. It is important to call relatives and friends to text them and to have video chats, read together as a family, pray together as a family, have family discussions. This is a time to make up for lost opportunities. Hard times can be periods we use to reset our lives. The COVID-19 pandemic is wrecking havoc on the global economy. Every country is struggling to implement plans and programs to lessen the impact, especially on the most vulnerable. I told you recently that we are fighting on two fronts. We are fighting a health battle and an economic and financial battle. We must and we will win both battles. We will have the greatest citizen army ever seen. This week, I will make an announcement for those who live in rental properties of a certain value, who have lost jobs or income because of COVID-19. Saving lives and protecting the health and safety of our citizens and residents is our priority. We must also meet the minimum needs of our economy. Accordingly, we decided to add a number of businesses to the emergency orders exemption list. However, these businesses may only operate under certain restrictions and must enforce physical distancing of three to six feet at all times. We must find new ways of stimulating economic growth. Even in the most challenging times, there exist opportunities. For example, the demand for delivery services will increase the need for more delivery service companies. The approval processes for investment projects, both domestic and international, will be exhilarated to ensure we get people back to work as quickly as possible. The Minister of Finance recently announced in the House of Assembly a number of measures designed to cushion the negative impact of COVID-19 and to stabilize our economy. Tomorrow in Parliament, the Minister of Finance the Deputy Prime Minister, Honorable Peter Turnquist, will announce further measures to help our most vulnerable and our businesses in our society. Foreign investment contributes significantly to our economic development. We previously announced the approval of several major investment projects on New Providence, Grand Bahama, Abaco, and Eleuthera. My office remains engaged with those investors and we are confident that we are in a most favorable position. We are taking steps to minimize any impediment 
to the implementation of these major products, projects. In addition, there are a number of other investment, domestic and international proposals before the government for consideration. We have already begun the process of expediting these proposals. I have directed the Bahamas Investment Authority in consultation with all relevant stakeholders to move aggressively to remove or minimize obstacles and to facilitate the implementation of these projects. We continue to approve incentives under the Hotels Encouragement Act for a number of small and medium-sized business which will assist them in their recovery. Last week, I visited the Emergency Operations Center at the Ministry of Health to say a special thank you to healthcare professionals coordinating the response of COVID-19. This week, I will hold a conference call with Family Island administrators to get an update on the preparation in Family Islands. I want to thank the healthcare workers and providers and the law enforcement officers who are on the front line of this COVID-19 fight. They are doing extraordinary work in these very challenging times. I want to thank all the public servants for continuing to work at their stations and those who continue to work from home. Despite the challenging times that we are in, the work of government must continue to go on. On behalf of the government and people of the Bahamas, I thank the many workers who provide essential services to the public. Too often, we forget the people who help to keep our country together and running. It is during emergencies that we remember the critical work of grocery store clerks, cashiers, parking boys and girls, store managers, security personnel, sanitation workers, gas attendants, pharmacists, food service workers, packers, delivery drivers, maintenance and cleaning workers, and the workers in nonprofit agencies. These workers continue to care for and to provide for all of us. Without them, we could not get through this difficult time. They are a major part of our citizen army. I want to personally, publicly thank each and every one of them. All legitimate work has dignity because of the dignity of the human being doing the work. Let us respect their skills and dedication. They too are on the front line. Please give them your thanks. A critical part of our response to the COVID-19 is being led by Dr. Merslin Dahl Regis, an internationally renowned public health professional and former chief medical officer. Dr. Dahl Regis is the coordinator of the COVID-19 response and a special advisor to the prime minister. On May 2nd, 2018 at Government House, I had the privilege of thanking Dr. Dahl Regis as she was receiving the Public Health Hero of the Americas Award from the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO. She was the second Caribbean national and the first Caribbean female to receive this prestigious award. I told her at that time, I thank you on behalf of the government and people of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas for the many years that you have given in service to the Bahamas and to the world. I told her, your work has helped to save lives. Your country owes you a tremendous gratitude. Generations to come will benefit from your vision 
and from your dedication. Mercilin, I wish to repeat what I said then. Thank you for helping to lead this fight today. You are truly a Bahamian hero. This country is fortunate to have you on the front line. Just a few days ago, the Roman Catholic community lost Sister Cecilia Albury, OSB, a Benedictine nun of many years. May she rest in peace. I wish to offer condolence to the Benedictine sisters of St. Martin's Monastery on Nassau Street, to Sister Cecilia's family and friends, and to the Roman Catholic community in the Bahamas. Sister Cecilia hailed from Harbor Island. She was the daughter of Mrs. Romilla Albury and was an organist at St. Thomas More Parish for many years. Sister Cecilia was a beautiful spirit. She was quiet, humbling, humble, and unassuming. Her life vocation was a primary school teacher in the Catholic school system. She was also involved with music ministry at Sacred Heart Parish. And when she left teaching, she served as the coordinator of the elder care ministry at St. Joseph Church, where she helped to care for many seniors during the day. Sister Cecilia and the nuns of St. Martin and so many other people in religious life lived lives of sacrifice and lives of service. Their ministry of faith, hope, and love was dedicated to our people in ministries ranging from teaching to caring for the sick, the poor, and the vulnerable. They poured and gave their lifeblood for our Bahamas. Their witness and testimony serve as an example to us all during this time. We are all called to service as a part of the common good. Each of us, each of us, have a role and a ministry we can offer during these difficult days, including the ministries of encouragement and support. Just as there are health care warriors on the front line, we need prayer warriors, not only to combat this disease, but to work against fear and to work against panic. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, we are reminded of the fruits of the Spirit. These fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let us share these fruits with one another as people of faith and as citizens of one Bahamas. Let us continue to encourage each other and to pray for one another. May God continue to bless each and every one of you, and God bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. I would now accept any questions that you may have. Jasper, I know you're ready to, to rock and roll. So you can have second question. Rashad? Yes, Rashad Rule from the Tribune. Um, are any of the newly confirmed cases connected to any of the previously confirmed cases? And can we get a general update on how many people have been tested to date, how many test kits we now have in the country, whether there's been any adjustment to the protocol, and has there been any suggestion that we may be seeing clusters forming anywhere in the country? CMO, Mike Millen. Okay, so to your first question, um, 
the new cases are not connected to any of the old cases. Um, the, the question regarding whether or not we are seeing linkages, we are beginning to believe that we are seeing some linkages, but we're still going through the data to be able to actually, I, I would say, analyze it a little bit more. We started um, the GIS mapping, um, as the Prime Minister would have referred to, um, and we anticipate that in short order, we will be able to say to you exactly what we believe the situation is. We can say, though, what we, what we do know is by how, what we have plotted already is there is community spread. So it's most important for us to actually follow what we have been, been asking uh, persons to do to diminish the likelihood of persons becoming infected because the virus is out there and it's widespread in our community. Testing update. Testing, uh, a total numbers tested, I don't have it right offhand, um, but I know last week, I think it was over 200 and some. I, 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 won't, I don't want to give you a wrong number, but I know we had moved beyond the 200 point. Um, and the test kits are, as we had said before, um, we have over 1,700 or so of the real-time PCR test kits, um, yeah, in country. And certainly um, our ongoing testing is as per our pro protocol, um, and we would continue to test as per, per, per protocol. So we have enough test kits in country. Is that come? Get your second question while you're standing. Yeah, there have been some concerns both locally and internationally that the lockdown represents a danger for certain people who find that the home is the least safe place for them to be. People who may be victims of domestic abuse or child abuse. And, and some countries are already reporting some increases of, of those incidents. Is the government doing anything proactively or are there any plans to reach out to these people who are at risk and provide solutions for them? Yeah, we have a very um, active police force, very efficient, reliable, and once um, those complaints are made, the police force will deal with them with the involvement of social services. Jasper? Hello, Jasper Ward, Nassau Guardian. Um, so earlier today, um, opposition leader Philip Rabe Davis would have called on the government to not only open back up the Bahamian borders, but also he kind of chimed in and something a lot of Bahamians have been saying is open our liquor stores. Um, does the government have any intentions to open, open the liquor stores during this time? I said earlier that all of our decisions are based on facts, data, and analysis. We are driven by the medical professions who give their best advice in terms of keeping us safe. They would along with the virus would make the determination as the border opening and then we stop certain um, um, procedures that we do now. So um, I'm not advised or moved by Philip Davis, I'm moved by the medical personnel. They make the final decision. So liquor stores will not be opened? No. Okay, <laughs> and my second question is, um, has any predictive modeling um, taken place at the Ministry of Health or with the government um, to see how many cases we expect to have? And if so, can you give the figures? I know you would have said we've um, had a double in cases um, in the last four days. And to add on to that question, earlier this week, the health minister would have said we have about 41 beds, if I'm not mistaken. Um, does that modeling indicate that we have enough beds for the surge that we will inevitably see? Thank you very much. Uh, the Bahamas, when we look at modeling, and we're attempting to do this, however, it's challenging to superimpose a small population model, uh, given what we have with existing models. Example, uh, we try to look at the gradient, the, in, the rate of increase. However, you cannot be a, be a challenge to compare that with other models because their gradient starts after they have 100 cases. We have 14 cases. And uh, so we're, ch we're challenged then to look at the first case, look at the time interval uh, when we got four cases, 
Then we looked at the period between the four cases and the 11 cases. And so you see a shortened time interval. And then we, within one day, we got another spike. So to answer your question, which is a good one, that um, we have to develop the model in the context of our populations, extrapolating into that model the experiences of the projected surge, say 20 days, what we have seen in other countries uh, consistently and in states in the US, that you have that period once you start a surge that is increased. However, we're hoping that our numbers remain low. And if they remain low during that period, then we are hoping to, after, after you've had the peak, to, uh, to flatten. Define low. <laughs> Good question. If, 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 the, if your modeling starts at 100 cases, starts, that's when the gradient, and we have 14, 14 is regarded as low. But Jasper, once, once the public followed the uh, directive and the recommendations of the health professional, then we would be in a better position. We do not want to see everybody running up and down the streets, racing, et cetera. Good afternoon. Eyewitness. Hi, good evening. Sanchesca Brown from Eyewitness News. In the last dashboard that was sent out, we noticed that the numbers of persons that were being quarantined jumped from 40 to 106. Um, can somebody tell me or tell the public how many of those persons are government quarantined in the facility and how many are being asked to self-isolate? Also, are we doing anything to monitor these persons to ensure that they do stay inside their homes or are we trusting them to self-quarantine? Okay, so the number did move from two to 106 and that relates to us actually combining our quarantine numbers. The government quarantine site had only two, but we had the, the remainder in self-quarantine. So that was the change. So now we will be reporting the full number. That is why you saw that change. Um, as it relates to monitoring, we actually, you know, we call, we monitor them through mostly calling contact. Uh, we, it, I think it's almost impossible to actually have, you know, patrols. And we ask them to be responsible and quarantine. But we do, from the surveillance unit, monitor whether or, you know, different, whether or not they are developing symptoms. So we do that on a daily basis. Uh, my other question, um, in other states in the U.S., they have um, charged people for who have been tested positive who still go out in public. Are we looking to do something like that? If you do catch someone who has tested positive in the food store <laughs> or... Mr. We, Prime Minister. we have not reached that stage yet. We have a very great citizens army, of which I know you will be a part of it, so we have not reached to that stage. The, I would love to see the curfew being lifted, but at the same time, my greatest responsibility is to save lives. That is first and paramount. Altamese. Good afternoon, sir. Alto V's Mornings from ZNS. Prime Minister, I know you said even in your national press conference of Hurricane Dorian and here with the COVID-19 cases not to spread fake news. I know one of the penalties you also announced was that if someone violates the curfew, it's either prison or a fine. Will there be some type, will the persons, whoever the police find, disseminate this fake news, get the same penalty, or is the government thinking of another penalty in order to reinforce your message for fake news to stop being disseminated? Whatever... The laws, whatever the, the, the laws um, state, and the punishment as dictated by the laws will be implemented. Is the next question? My next question is piggybacking on what Sanchesa asked about self isolation. Are health officials also monitoring the mental health of these persons who have contracted the disease and those who are in quarantine? Because there may be some type of fear that if they do, alleged, uh, maybe some alleged fear that if they do recover from, and they come out 
if the curfew is ever ended, that they may re get the virus again. Ms. Dr. Forbes? <laughs> Thank you very much. I can answer the second part of your question first, which is, can you get the virus again? The most esteemed infectious diseases doctor in the world. Uh, we, we do not think so. This is Dr. Tony Fauci. It is a new virus, and so we are learning more about it every day. Certainly, as we can see from other viruses of this kind, people will develop an immune response after getting this kind of infection. And that may wane over time, but most definitely he said this morning that he thinks that um, you would be somewhat protected and it would be highly unlikely that you would get SARS coronavirus or COVID-19 again. So I am not a specialist in mental health, but I am honored to work at their side. And we are looking at mental health and how we can foster it in times of crisis. I don't want to overspeak, but we will have forum coming up early this week where we can address that. And certainly there's information going around in terms of how you can secure your mental health, take a break if you're working from home, try and get exercise, communicate with family. Even though it's tempting, try not to um, binge watch for lack of a better term, television um, with, with these reports, but on the other hand, still take it seriously. So to answer your question, simply about mental health, yes, we're, we are looking at it, and it's very important. You're welcome. Jerome, you are, an you are anchoring tonight. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good spot to be in. Uh, good evening, Jerome Sawyer from RTV. My question has to do a bit with the contact tracing. It's my understanding that uh, once a case has been identified, people who may have had contact with that individual are being notified. Uh, people are expressing concern that those individuals may not be tested. Um, and the question they're asking is why aren't we testing those individuals who may have come in contact with somebody who has now tested positive? Chief Medical Officer. Okay, so there, there's levels of... Uh, I would say exposure. Certainly we need to know all of the contacts and we will, as I alluded to a few moments ago, we make contact with them while they are, they are in quarantine. Um, and certainly if persons actually become symptomatic, then we will need to test. But why you go in quarantine is to monitor you in the event you develop symptoms. And at that point, we will need to test. So we get the full list of contacts for each case, monitor them for symptoms, and if they actually become symptomatic, we go ahead and test. Because they, once they are symptomatic, they become a suspect case. So all contacts will not be tested. Are they aware of that? Are they being told that specifically? Because there is some concern uh, that people are expressing that they're just being told to, I guess, isolate, quarantine um, at that point, but they're not being told why they're not being tested. Okay, um, there's, I mean, that kind of conversation should be happening as you actually do the contact tracing. Um, and certainly we have to reach out to persons for the full period of their quarantine. So what I would suggest that persons do, um, as our healthcare providers reach out to them on a daily basis, if they, are, if they have questions related to what is happening, feel free to ask those questions. And then we also have the, uh, you know, the lines that we would have put out there that they could call and ask those kinds of questions. But yeah, really and truly, uh, I think certainly testing every contact would be very, uh, it's absolutely not recommended and it, it is something we're not doing. Okay. My second question has to do with the um, new cases. Two of the individuals are hospitalized, correct? The new would cases? Pardon me? The new cases? The, the three, yeah. The three, three, new, three cases. new cases. yeah. No. Well, yes. We Two have... of them are hospitalized, okay. correct? Mm -hmm. uh, these are part of the new cases the, that were just the three that were just announced today, or were they hospital? Or were these a part of, I guess, over the past few days? That's One the of the one. new cases would okay. be hospitalized, and the other two, no. 
what are the conditions? They uh, are all stable. They are all stable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in relation to that, um, the fact that we are seeing the hospitalizations now, up to this point, we've really only had one who has been discharged. Mm -hmm. Is that a concern that we may begin to see more individuals hospitalized? And also, are any of these people who have tested positive either visitors or healthcare workers? Okay. So to your first question, um, there is always concern that we will see an, uh, an increase in cases um, as it relates to increase in cases actually needing to be hospitalized. Um, that is even more concerning. But we're hoping that we don't get to that point with the measures that we would have actually put in place um, and also with the contact tracing that we're doing, uh, once we get a case, we're hoping that those public health measures along with the, the, the distancing measures uh, will help us not to get to the point where we get a surge in cases, cases period, and even more so cases requiring hospitalization. That is one of the reasons that we, you know, as public health specialists, made the recommendations along the lines of doing these things so that we could actually allow our health system to be able to manage you know, any cases that we would have in country. So that was question one, I think. Part one. <laughs> part uh, one. Part two. Are any of these cases uh, visitors or healthcare professionals? They are all, all nationals. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly we have a healthcare professional, I believe, in this group, yes. Jerome, thank you very much. I know you have a large following. Many people watch you, so I am depending on you to have one of your shows of the importance and the significance of us establishing a citizen's army. And I know... No, 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 no. no. Anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, members of the press, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day.